My name is Tawana Ganawine Miller. I'm Iroquois, known as Haudenosaunee, translated as People of the Longhouse. I'm a Mohawk artist from Ganawage, Quebec, Canada. The video you are about to see is my art pertaining to Iroquois stories and culture. My work is inspired by Haudenosaunee storytellers Tom Porter and Daryl Thompson. Both are from the Mohawk Nation of Akwazasne. This is a brief summary of the stories behind my work. I begin with my self-portrait, title Mohawk Portrait, size 30 by 40 inches. My mother, Barbara Little Bear DeLille, told me of a dream she had with bear paws going up to the sky. I started with my image and my clan, the bear. Next, I asked my children to help. I started at the bottom, placing my painted handprints onto the canvas. Next was my oldest daughter, Kadat Rahawi. She holds the clans. My next daughter, Ochahori. She kindles the fire. And my youngest, my son, Jaosarade, a bright winter day. It feels like I'm passing along my knowledge to the next generation to come along. Hopefully, they shall continue. I've incorporated beadwork into this painting because I've been doing it for over 25 years now and wanted to blend both the painting and beadwork together. This is an actual photo I took of a condolence cane owned by Darren Bonaparte. He is known for his skills in recreating and reading the wampum belts. The condolence cane is arranged in the form of a symbolic longhouse with the Mohawk titles at the eastern door, the Senecas at the western door, and the Onondagas at the center of the council fire, with the Oneidas being to their east and the Cayugas to their west. The cane is used as a roll call of the chiefs. When a chief dies, it's used to raise chiefs, installing a new chief. It is a record of the 50 hereditary chief titles, which were given at the time of the forming of the League of Five Nations. These titles live forever. In the words of William Martin Bouchamp, who lived from 1830 to 1925, witnessed a Haudenosaunee condolence ritual in the 20th century. This is what he wrote. The forest paths were symbolically cleared. Thorns were taken out of the feet. Tears were wiped away. The throat and ears cleansed that all might speak and hear. The heart was restored to its right place and clouds removed from the sun in the sky. Blood was washed from the seat, and if anyone had died, graves were leveled or covered. The bones of the slain were gathered and hidden under the roots of some great tree. The Council of the Mohawk shall be divided into three parties. The first three are the turtle. The second set of three are the wolves. The third set of three are the bears. I created three clan condolence symbol paintings, size eight by 10 inches. I made these paintings to help us remember the condolence cane symbols that go with our clans of the Mohawk Nation. This is the turtle clan painting. It is the turtle clan's responsibility to look after the environment. The turtles represent the earth, as well as all the gifts that the earth provides the people. The turtle teaches patience and to never give up with the use of strength and solidarity. The turtle is old and wise and well respected. Turtle clan people need a strong base where they can live and grow roots. They move slowly to teach patience. Lessons learned are not forgotten. Although turtles may appear slow, their determination allows them to obtain their goals. Turtle clan, condole chief titled meanings. The names will be read from right to left. One between two worlds. Two, he combs his hair. Three, words of equal height. This is the Wolf Clan. The people of the Wolf Clan are known as the Fire Keepers. They are the Pathfinders, as it is the wolf that gives us direction and the way we should go on the pathways of life. The wolf is responsible for guiding the people in their lives to live in the way the Creator wished for them. The wolf is respected for its sense and importance of family, teaching us to use our ears and to be watchful just as family does. In nature, the wolf seeks out and explores new situations to find new knowledge and return it to the pack. 
Passion, generosity, sympathy, and understanding are all qualities of the Wolf Clan. The Wolf Clan are often the ones to whom others turn to in time of need. They have a great sense of curiosity, and while they might explore on their own, they prefer the company of others. Wolf Clan condole chief title meanings. Number four, tree branches out. Number five, our life sustainers. And number six, the principal eagle. This is the Bear Clan. The Bear Clan is the caretaker of the Earth's medicines. The Iroquois people have passed on stories for generations about how the Bear Clan people came to receive the gift of medicines from an elder woman who had the knowledge of healing and the medicines from the Earth. The legend says that an Iroquois village was visited by a strange man seeking food and shelter. This stranger was turned away by every longhouse he came to until he came to the house of the Bear Clan. The elder woman of the house welcomed him in and shared her food with him. The next morning, the stranger became sick and told the old woman to go gather a certain plant. He told her how to make a medicine from it, and when he took the medicine, he was better. The next day, the stranger became sick again with a different sickness. Again, he sent the woman to gather a plant and instructed her how to make a medicine from it. The cycle repeated as the man came down with many different sicknesses sent the woman to gather many different plants and instructed her how to prepare them to cure the sickness. This stranger was the creator, and he taught her cures for all the sicknesses of his people. He told her from that day on, members of the Bear Clan were keepers of the medicines, and medicine men and women were to always belong to the Bear Clan. Bear Clan, condole chief titled meanings. Number seven, his horns are dragging. Number eight, he puts on rattles. Number nine, Big Branch. Spirit Clans, size 36 by 48 inches. The Mohawks of Ganawage have three clans, the Turtle, Bear, and Wolf. Clans are headed by clan mothers. Their duties include choosing the chiefs, reminding the chiefs of their duty, giving clan names to children, and meeting obligations to the medicine societies. They can remove a chief from office when necessary. I zoomed in the circle from the center of the Spirit Clan painting. Starting from the top right, Oneida, people of the Standing Stone, also known as the Younger Brothers. Mohawk, people of the Flint, known as Keepers of the Eastern Door. Tuscarora, shirt-wearing people, not an original member of the Iroquois. They joined in 1722 after they had been forced to leave North Carolina in 1714 after a war with the English colonists. Cayuga, people of the swamp, those of the Great Pipe, also younger brothers. Seneca, people of the Great Hill, known as keepers of the Western Door. Onondaga, people of the hills, known as keepers of the fire. Hiawatha painting inspired by the Hiawatha wampum belt, size 16 by 20 inches. The turtle represents the sky or universe that surround us, and the white represents purity and good mind. The White tree is our laws and teachings. The roots are the Iroquois people keeping those laws and teachings alive. Beneath I use the dome symbol to show the Gostoa headdress and the feathers worn on top by each nation of the Iroquois Confederacy. Zoomed in a little closer. If you look closely under the dome, I've highlighted the letter of each nation in the design. From left to right, I'll describe it in detail. Seneca has one feather standing. They are people of the Great Hill and keepers of the Western Door. Cayuga has one sloped feather. They are people of the Swamp. Center is the Onondaga, three letter O's to represent many letters in the name. One standing feather and one sloped feather. They are the Fire Keepers. Oneida has two standing feathers and one sloped feather. They are the people of the Standing Stone. Mohawk have three standing feathers. They are the people of the Flint and keepers of the Eastern Door. The two-row wampum painting, size 11 by 14 inches. The 1613 treaty was recorded by the Haudenosaunee in a wampum belt known as the two-row wampum. Haudenosaunee tradition records a specific meaning of the belts as follows. You say that you are our father, and I am your son. We say we will not be like father and son, but like brothers. This wampum belt confirms our words. These two rows will symbolize two paths or two vessels traveling down the same river together. One, a birch bark canoe will be for the Indian people, their laws, their customs, and their ways. 
The other, a ship, will be for the white people and their laws, their customs, and their ways. We shall each travel the river together, side by side, but in our boat. Neither of us will make compulsory laws or interfere in the eternal affairs of the other. Neither of us will try to steer the other's vessel. As long as the sun shines upon this earth, this is how long our agreement will stand. Second, as long as the water still flows. And third, as long as the grass grows green at a certain time of the year. Now we have symbolized this agreement, and it shall be binding forever, as long as Mother Earth is still in motion. This agreement has been kept by the Iroquois to this date. The treaty is considered by the Haudenosaunee people to still be in effect. In Sky World, the beings didn't know what it was to weep or to feel sorrow. They never experienced death. In one lodge, there dwelt two beings, the female staying on the north side and the male staying on the south side. One morning, after eating, the man being asked the female to braid his hair. The man became ill and died. They placed his body towards the rising sun inside the lodge in a place high up. The beings, for the first time, wept because of his death. The female was pregnant. Others asked her who the father was. She would not give an answer. She gave birth to a daughter. Now others asked this new child being who her father was. She refused to answer. The young female began to grow. One day she started to cry nonstop. Nothing would soothe the child. Her mother brought her to the place of her father's burial, and this calmed the child immediately. She climbed to the top and looked upon him. When she came down, she would begin to weep again. After a time of placing her up there to see him, it was decided to leave a ladder there, so whenever she should desire to see him, she could go herself. Those watching her could hear her having a conversation, as though she was replying to his remarks. One day, she came down and told her mother she was given instructions to get married. She said, Far away toward the sun rising, there he lives, and he is the chief of the people that live there. In that place we will be married. Her mother made bread of sodden corn and mixed berries in it, and placed it in her daughter's basket to take on the journey. Early the next morning, the daughter headed out on her journey. She came upon a floating log. She was confused and doubted her directions. Feeling lost, she returned to her father. She climbed the ladder. Others heard her say, Father, I came back thinking that perhaps I lost my way. For the reason that I arrived so quickly at the point you described to me, for the sun had scarcely moved any distance before I arrived where you told me, there would be a river which is crossed by means of a log. This is the place where I returned. He informed her that she had not been lost. She was supposed to cross the maple log that is supported by clumps of young saplings of basswood and ironwood. She came down and proceeded with her journey again. She was instructed not to allow any beings from stopping her on her journey. She was also told of all things to come. Once again, she arrived to the floating log and crossed over to the other side. Going a short distance, she heard, Ahem! Behind the bushes, it was Aurora Borealis, going, Ahem! again. She ignored him and continued near the point of leaving the forest when she saw Fire Dragon of the Storms. He said, Stand still for a time. Rest yourself, for now you must be wearied. She ignored him and kept walking. Before she went much further, he said, Are you not ashamed, since the man you come to see is so old? She did not stop and kept walking. She reached a grassy clearing, seeing in the center of the village was a lo lodge with a chief and his people. She went forth and stepped inside the chief's lo lodge. She told him, We too marry. He instructed her to sit on the other side of the fire. The day passed with no more communication. When the darkness entered, he said, you shall lie here. He put a mat down for her. They did not lie together. They only placed their feet together with their heads at opposite ends. The morning dawned. He started a fire. He came out and handing, handling her over strings of white corn. He told her, It is customary that one is living among the people of her spouse must work. You must make mush of hulled corn. She shelled the corn while he poured water into the pot hung above the fire. 
Then she finished shelling, hulling, and parboiling the corn in the water. She put it in the mortar. She got their pestle and pounded the corn until it was done. The water in the pot was now boiling. He told her, Remove your garments. She did as instructed and placed the meal into the boiling water. As she stirred it with a large spoon, the corn mush began to splatter continuous drops on her, but she acted as though she didn't feel the burning. When the mush was cooked, her whole naked body was fully splattered. He removed the pot from the fire and opened another door, saying, My slaves, both of you, come here. Two large dogs emerged. He said to the both of them, Both of you, wipe from along her naked body the mush spots that have fallen on her. It is said their tongues were so sharp and rough that it felt was like tree bark. Whenever they licked, they drew blood. When they finished, he returned her dress and brought over some sunflower oil to heal her wounds. He gave the mush corn food to the dogs. When the dogs finished eating, he returned them to the other room. Now he said, Is it true or is it not that you have desires that you and I should marry? So, now, you and I do marry. Three nights passed. They did not lie together, but placed their feet together, both placing their heads in opposite directions. On the third morning, he climbed up and drew down quarters of meat that had been dried until it piled high. He took her basket and packed it until it was full. Then he gave, her, gave it a shake. Making more room, he filled it again. This was done three times. Now he said, When you arrive to your home, you and the inhabitants of the place must assemble in the council. The meat shall be equally divided among you. You must tell them that they must remove the thatched roofs from their lodges when the evening darkness comes, and then they must go out of them. They must store all the corn hail that will fall into the lodges, for indeed it will rain corn this very night when you arrive there. So now you must bear on your back by means of the forehead strap this basket of dried venison. No matter how tired you become, you must not adjust the burden strap. The reason he gave her people corn was because he had one of their people as a spouse. She did as instructed and brought the meat to her people along with instructions to remove their roofs. When this was completed, she returned. After a time, he then said, I am ill. His people were confused. They never experienced sickness. He told his people to uproot the tree standing in front of his lodge and he would lay in a position under it. This tree gave light to the people, and he was known, and it was known as the tree of life, but they did as, as instructed and uprooted it. He said to his wife, Will you spread for me something where, beside the place where the tree stood? She spread something for him there, and he laid upon it. Then he said, Come, and sit beside my body. She did sit next to, to him there. Then he said, Why don't you hang your, hang your legs down into the abyss? Where they had uprooted the tree, there was a deep hole, which extended through to the nether world, and where earth could be seen. All his people were assembled above their watching, for they were still confused about illness. He was now recovered from being sick, and turned himself over, resting on his elbow. He said, Look into the hole, and see what things are occurring there in that place. So she bent her body forward into the hole, and looked in. He placed his fingers against the nape of her neck and pushed her. She fell in. Then he rose to a standing posture and said, Now replace the tree that all of you have uprooted. They immediately reset the tree so that it stood just as it did before the time they had uprooted it. Sky Woman's Descent, size 16 by 20 inches. Sky Woman fell through the hole in Sky World. As she was falling, she managed to grab a handful of roots and plant seeds from the Tree of Life in Sky World. She kept it clutched in her hands during her descent. The geese helped transport her as she fell, and the great sea turtle received her on his back. Three animals, the otter, beaver, and muskrat, went to the bottom of the water to retrieve soil. The otter died before he could reach bottom. The beaver also died before getting soil. The muskrat returned with soil in his paw, with his last breath, and perished. Here, on the sea turtle's back, she planted bits of roots and plants she had brought from the sky world. 
she walked counterclockwise around the turtle's back, planting, praying, and creating the earth as we know as Turtle Island. Conception by the West Wind, size 16 by 20 inches. The woman who had fallen from the sky then had a daughter, who became impregnated by the West Wind. The West Wind placed two arrows across her chest, one being sharp and the other being blunt. While in the womb, the daughter's unborn twins began to quarrel about how they should emerge. The right-handed twin came out the normal way. The left-hand twin, refusing to be born in the usual way, forced himself out of his mother's left armpit, killing her as a result. The grandmother, known as Sky Woman, asked the twin boys, Who killed her? The left-handed twin said it was his brother that killed her, and she believed him. Three Sisters of the Iroquois, size 24 by 30 inches. The newborn twins, with the help of their grandmother, buried their mother. From her heart grew the strawberry plant, her feet grew the potato plant, and the center of her grew the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. All around her grew up medicine plants, the sacred tobacco, sweet grass, sage, and cedar, used to send messages and thanks to the sky world and creator. The Three Sisters Bloom, size 24 by 48 inches. This is a contemporary version of the Three Sisters. To the Iroquois people, corn, beans, and squash are the Three Sisters, the physical and spiritual sustainers of life. The three vegetables compose the main food supply of the Iroquois. These life-supporting plants were given to the people when all three miraculously sprouted from the body of Sky Woman's daughter, granting the gift of agriculture to the Iroquois. Twins intertwine, size 24 by 30 inches. The two brothers continued to compete with each other as they created the animals and plants, and in the process represented different ways of living. Right-handed twin created the beautiful hills, lakes, blossoms, and gentle creatures. And the left-handed twin created the jagged hills from kicking them in addition to the whirlpools, thorns, and predators. Right-handed twin was always truthful, reasonable, and good-hearted, and the straight arrow. The left-handed twin in life fought, rebelled, and made crooked choices. Because the right-handed twin created human beings, he is known as our creator and the master of life. The left-handed twin helped and invented rituals of sor sorcery and healing. The world they built both included cooperation and competition, loving kindness, and anger. After they finished their creations, they continued to compete with each other by playing lacrosse and fighting with clubs. One day, the left-handed twin took all the kind and gentle creatures his brother had created and hid them in a cave. These animals were trapped in a cave by the left-handed twin for his own use. By doing this, he was depriving mortals of having the benefit of these deer and other animals as intended by the Great Spirit. When the white right-handed twin discovered what his brother had done, he hid along the path and he waited until his brother left before climbing down to the ground and walking to the mouth of the cave. Inside, he could find many different types of animals. He set all the animals free and began his journey home. It was not long before the left-handed twin discovered what that all the captives were free. He knew his brother was behind this action, and he began to plot the revenge. The brothers got into a, fu into a fight. Grasping a deer antler, the right-handed twin finally prevailed and killed his brother, throwing the body of the left-handed twin over the edge of the earth and into the night. As a result, the right-handed twin rules day and the sky world, and the left-handed twin prevails over night and the lower world. The grandmother was furious that the right-handed twin murdered his brother and accused him of wrongdoing. Angry and believing that grandmother had always favored the badly behaved left-handed twin, he cut off her head and threw it up toward the sky where it became the moon and she could now be with her favorite grandson at night. Then he threw her body into the ocean where it became the, all the fish of the sea. The sea. Iroquois believe that both the left-handed twin and the right-handed twin are necessary for the world to be in balance. During festivals, day activities honor the right-handed twin, and night activities such as feasting, singing, and dancing 
honor the left-handed twin. This tension and struggle for balance between the two brothers and principles of life is incorporated into Iroquois festivals and the cycles of life. You know, size 36 by 48 inches. In an Iroquois myth and legend, Hino, the god of thunder, is an object of great respect because of the powerful aid he renders to those he favors. He is believed to direct the rain, which shall fertilize the seeds and the earth. He also gives aid to the harvesters when the fruits of the earth have ripened. While traveling the celestial vault and around the earth, he bears with him an enormous basket filled with huge boulders of chert rock. These he casts either rocks or lightning at e any evil spirit or monster he may encounter. Some of these creatures are not meant to interact with humans, and if they attempt to make their presence known, he comes to our aid. Beginning of the Flying Head, size 24 by 30 inches. This legend origins is from Skanadaga Valley, which at one point the home to the Mohawk Indians and was settled by Sir William Johnson in the 1700s. The names of these aboriginals have long since been forgotten. The young warriors requested to leave the area in search of richer hunting grounds. The chiefs disagree disagreed and refused to relocate. Upon this reaction, the young warriors killed the old chiefs by cutting off their heads. After killing the elders, the question of the disposal of their remains was a problem. According to the legend, they wished in some way to sanctify the onslaught by offering up the bodies to the master of life. They agreed to burn the bodies. Each warrior took one head in his canoe, following the head warrior. They went to the center of the lake and handed the heads one at a time to who planned the crime. As he bounded them together with a huge rock, he became entangled with their hair. His canoe tipped over, and he went under with the heads. The legend goes on to say that the remaining warriors watched as bubbles of slime appeared on the lake, exposing a terrible monster, a giant head, slowly developing wings progressing out of the lake over six days. This is the beginning of the story of the flying head. Cornhusk Couple and Cornhusk Family The corn spirit was so thrilled at being one of the sustainers of life that she asked the creator what more she could do for her people. The creator said that a beautiful doll could be formed from her husks. So the creator set to work forming the doll. When he finished, he gave the doll a beautiful face and sent it to the children of the Iroquois to play with and to make them happy. The doll went from village to village, playing with the children and doing whatever she could. Everywhere she went, everyone would tell her how beautiful she was. So after a while, she became vain. The creator spoke to her and explained that this was not the right kind of behavior, and she agreed not to be this way any more. The creator explained that if she continued with this behavior, then he would have to punish her, but he would not tell her how. She agreed not to act or feel this way any more, and things went on as before. One afternoon, she was walking by a creek and glanced into the water. As she had admired herself, she couldn't help think how beautiful she was, because indeed she was beautiful. But this time the Creator sent a giant screech owl out of the sky, and it snatched her reflection from the water. When she looked again, she had no reflection. This was the punishment the Creator put upon her. When an Iroquois mother gives a corn husk doll to her child, she tells them this legend. It is wrong to think they are better than anyone else, and that the Creator has given a special gift to everyone. From that day on, no cornhouse doll is allowed to have a face. <laughs>